Yeah. Crouchy, do you want to sit? Your husband yeah. can stand right behind you. All right, we can stay. You can move the chairs if you want to space it out a little bit. Mismo la David, Adonai Roy, Loech Sar, Pinotesha Yarbitzen Yamem Rochot Yanachaleni, Nafshi Shoveit, Yanacheni Lamaglet Sadak Lamaan Shamo, Lan Kirelech Begit Salmavet. Lo irara ki ata imadim Shiftecha u mishantecha Hema yinach amoni Taroch lefanai shulchan Neged tzurirai Tishanta vashamem roshi, kosiri vaya. Achto vachased yudifuni, koya mechayai. Vishabeti, bivet adonai, leorech yami. Friends, I've chanted for you the words of our 23rd Psalm. In these moments where our hearts are breaking, when we are yearning to be near to each other, we are in search of strength, in search of comfort, and so we often turn to the psalmist, and I ask you to join me as we recite these words together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember him. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember him. In the blueness of sky and in the warmth of summer, we will remember him. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember him. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember him. When we are lost and sick at heart, we will remember him. When we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember him. So long as we live, he too will live, for he is now a part of us, as we remember Dr. Erwin Kornbluth. To you, Susie, and to his children, Mark, David, Carly, Kathy, Heidi, David, Michael, and also to Wendy, David, Rob, Ben, Aaron, and Erica, to his siblings, his sisters, Jojo and Ellie, and his brothers-in-law, Bram and Paul, and to his grandchildren, Rachel, Jason, Tyler, Dustin, Andy, Ryan, Charlie, Elise, Matthew, Jeremy, Lauren, Rose, Skylar, Aubrey, and Ian, to all of the members of the family, 
to so many dear and cherished friends, to those gathered here today, to so many who are joining us via technology, we come together, although we are separated, we are together in our hearts as we remember and celebrate the life of your beloved Corny. Our sages have taught us that birth is a beginning and death a destination and life is a journey from childhood to maturity and from youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness and often back again, from health to sickness and back we pray to health again. From offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion and from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination. And life, life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage to life everlasting. Birth is a beginning. How well did Dr. Did Dr. Irwin Kornblith understand that phrase? And life is a journey. Your beloved Corny understood that phrase all too well. Corny's journey began in Montreal, Canada. He was born on September 12, 1936 to Abe and Ann Kornblith. Corny, along with his two sisters, Jojo and Ellie, grew up in a warm and loving home. And while the family endured their share of financial struggles, this family was rich in their practice of Jewish traditions and Jewish values and in their love for the land of Israel. The Kornbluth home was overflowing with the wealth of music and multilingual conversations and an emphasis on education. Corny's father, Abe, was an observant Jew who worked various jobs to provide for his family, and his mother, Anne, worked in a dress shop, always making sure that her children had the most wonderful memories of summer camp and snowy winter hikes and Passover seders where everyone was welcome. As a youth and teen growing up in Montreal, Corny was surrounded by the safe feeling of his Jewish neighborhood, but he also knew much too often the harsh sting of anti-Semitism. He had a wonderful group of friends. Many of these childhood friends grew to become lifelong friends. And this was especially true with his friendships that were nourished while attending and working at Camp Massad, a Jewish overnight camp where only Hebrew was spoken. I had the opportunity yesterday to speak with his sister, Ellie. She described Corny as a wonderful brother. Ellie shared that she and Jojo were the athletes in the family, and she said Corny was the bookworm. His studious ways certainly paid off as Corny was always at the top of his class. His mom saved every single academic award presented to Corny dating all the way back to kindergarten. And Ellie lovingly explained to me that Corny was protective of her and Jojo. And she recalled how much she loved listening to the radio. So much so that he'd have the radio playing throughout the night and the wee hours of the morning. Ellie told me that she and Jojo shared a bedroom and Corny's bedroom was right next to their room. She would hear his radio playing sometimes at one and two in the morning. And Ellie, as she told me, being very conscious that money was tight for the family, she would tiptoe into his room to turn off the radio and save on electricity. At the moment Ellie had her hand on the dial, she would hear Corny in the dark room say, 
don't turn it off, I'm listening. His love of music went far beyond the act of listening to the radio, as Corny played many instruments, the banjo, the flutophone, a little piano, the harmonica, the mandolin, and more. Ellie remembered family trips to their grandparents' cottage. This would have been Anne's parents' cottage where she and Jojo slept on the living room, slept in the living room, and Corny slept in the kitchen. Ellie also shared memories of family gatherings with her father's side of the family. Every Sunday afternoon, when 14 adults and 16 grandchildren would come together as a family. While Ellie is in Canada at the moment, unable to join us in person due to the pandemic, the heartwarming memory she has shared with me and certainly with all of us, these are memories of a loving and sweet brother and these are truly a blessing. And I also spoke with his brother-in-law, Bram, Bram thought he knew Corny for, well, maybe about 66 years. And they worked together at, as counselors at Camp Massad. In speaking with Bram, he was proud to share that he was the one to introduce Corny to waterfront instruction. <laughs> he also shared that Corny was that good looking guy at Camp Massad who ran the waterfront and supervised the dock. And he was also the guy who had a lot of the teenage girls swooning over him. Corny's forte was water skiing, and he wrote the very first water ski instruction manual for the Canadian Red Cross. Did I get that detail correct? Okay, <laughs> just want to make sure. Bram also shared with me stories of Corny's natural ability as a student. In Bram's words, he simply said, he was brilliant. Apparently, they only went through the 11th grade, and before going off to university, the way it was in Canada was that each student was required to take what was known as matriculation exams. Bram remembered that Corny's scores were so high they were published in the local newspaper. Bram also remarked that he was always welcome at the Kornbluth home. Bram remembered every other Friday night he was part of the family's Shabbat meal. And he remembered how much Corny's sisters, Jojo and Ellie, how much they adored their brother, not just for the rides in his Pontiac convertible, but more importantly, for his kind, gentle, and warm-hearted ways as their brother. Following his graduation from Strathcona Academy High School, Corny matriculated to McGill University, where he majored in physiology. With his extroverted personality, he had no trouble in making many new and wonderful friends. And between his undergrad studies at McGill and then going off to medical school between these two opportunities, Corny decided to backpack throughout Europe and Israel, and he brought along his banjo, and the not-so-shy Corny would play tunes on his stringed instrument at a moment's notice. He collected stickers from all the places he visited and proudly displayed them on his banjo case. He returned from this adventure and began his studies at McGill University's College of Medicine. Initially, Corny was practicing internal medicine at the Jewish General Hospital but he was also offered an opportunity to study and work in a very special cardiovascular program offered at Harvard. But he turned it down. Corny wanted to pursue his career in an area that focused not just on life, but on new life. And so his journey led him in the direction of obstetrics. Corny met and married Harriet Burnick and Harriet I know that the marriage was a 14 year union, one which brought forth three wonderful children, your children, Mark, David, and Carly. And as the years passed, as time moved on, Harriet, it seems that you and Corny discovered a new type of friendship. And with Alan and Harriet, and also Susie and Corny, a beautiful and unique friendship took shape. I know that following his stroke in 1999, things, many things for Corny and for everyone who was a part of his life, took a drastic change. And Harriet and Alan, you stepped in as good friends. And Alan, you stepped up and you helped Corny 
in many ways, but especially in his ability to get to his golf game. An incredible league known as the Strokers, a league for those who had suffered from strokes or other brain injuries. You got him there, Alan. Harriet and Alan, you were by Corny's side visiting with him, I believe, the day before he passed. And your love and your support has not gone unnoticed. Susie, your initial meeting of Corny was, well, <laughs> suffice it to say, it wasn't the best first meeting. But years later, I think maybe through the urging of a friend, along with maybe a little dash of magic and some luck, a first date between the two of you happened. It was a dinner date. He took you to the Wagon Wheel restaurant. And Susie, you found him to be engaging and funny. You said he was funny. His jokes were not the greatest, but his sense of humor was <laughs> terrific. But with his humor and his wit and that smile, he won you over. And you and Corny married on October 13th, 1996. And as you journeyed through 23, 24 years of marriage, it's also true that the two of you journeyed the world together visiting so many places, including Mexico and Italy, Israel and France, and so many others. And Susie, you knew him to be a man who was interesting and a romantic guy. He'd leave you little notes, leave little gifts for you. A number of Corny's family members, those who we spoke with on the Zoom just a few days ago, and in speaking with Ellie and Bram, they assured me that you were the love of his life and you, Susie, told me that he was the love of your life. Just two years and three months into your marriage, Corny suffered a stroke, and it's true that this changed so much for Corny, but it did not change who he was. You said instead of him asking, why me? He would say, why not me? Perhaps the most challenging fact was that Dr. Erwin Kornbluth, a physician who was completely dedicated to his parents, would no longer be able to practice. Corny would admit that he did not miss performing the surgeries, but he truly missed the patients. I think you shared with me, Susie, that in his years of practice, he delivered more than 10,000 babies, really and that he had the extra joy of delivering what we'll call many second generation babies. That is, those are the babies of the babies he delivered. <laughs> Susie, you knew a man who, in the years following his stroke, would volunteer his time with graduate students at Cleveland State University, and he'd explain to them what it meant and what it felt like to have survived a stroke. And Susie, I know you have been a marvelous and loving and dedicated caretaker. But four years ago, when it became necessary for additional assistance, Courtney moved to Menorah Park. This was a family decision. And again, Courtney could have said, why me? He could have been angry, but instead he was grateful. He showed gratitude. And so your beloved Corny at Menorah Park, instead of sitting back and watching the world pass him by, he became engaged. He never missed the daily music program. And as a student of life, he also took classes at Menorah Park, classes on stroke and brain injury in hopes of perhaps improving his own situation. Classes on Alzheimer's in hopes of maybe helping his sister, Jojo. Corny had a passion for learning and his optimism demonstrated that he never stopped believing that life could be better. And through this all, this love affair, the love and respect that you showed each other, it never wavered and it never diminished. In speaking with Corny's children, they described their father with many different phrases and adjectives. And so I share with you their collective thoughts as they spoke of their dad by saying he was warm and selfless. He was the one who always found the positive in any situation. He demonstrated an excellent work ethic. He never complained. He taught his children to take advantage of every opportunity. They saw a father who was helpful to others and supportive of, all, of others. And all he wanted was for his children to experience as much of life as they possibly could. 
He was the dad always with a smile and a story and in so many ways he was bigger than life. And one of these ways is when you went out to dinner with Corny, he was bigger than life. As everyone would discuss which appetizers, which two or three appetizers they should order and share around the table, Corny would say, well, I think David, you put it best when you said he would just order the left side of the menu. He would say, we'll have one of everything. And the same was true when dessert time came. We'll have one of everything. That was Corny, bigger than life. Carly, you told me that his name summed up his jokes, Corny, or as our kids might say, dad jokes. And Mark and David and Carly, they knew a father growing up who spoke Hebrew, Yiddish, French. Later, he learned Russian. He taught himself some Spanish and Japanese. You knew a dad who was into astronomy and origami and a man who loved to attend the symphony. He was so deeply moved by music. And he was also there for you, Kathy, and your siblings, Heidi, David, and Michael. I mean, Kathy, you shared you were 13 years old when he went on that first date with your mom. He's been a part of your life and your siblings' lives for so long. And for Wendy and David and Rob and Ben and Aaron and Erica, you all held a very special place in his heart. What was most important to him was that you would all enjoy a good and long life. Your father liked the saying, it's a horrible saying, but we're gonna say it anyhow. The reward for not killing your children is having grandchildren. It's a horrible and true saying, isn't it? And so to Corny's 15 grandchildren, to Rachel and Jason, to Tyler and Dustin and Andy, Ryan and Charlie, to Elise and Matthew and Jeremy and Lauren and Rose and Skylar, Aubrey and Ian, you know, those of you who are here in person, those of you who are watching, you know that your Saba absolutely adored you. All of you felt as if your Saba could do anything. He loved you, he loved being in your lives, and he was thrilled to always know the details of your life, how school was going, how an exam was going. I think one of, one of you mentioned to me that if he knew on Monday that you had an exam the following Thursday, he would get in touch with you to find out how that went. He was also interested if an exam or a class made you particularly anxious. There's a story that David told and that Rachel knows all too well. David, you'll have to jump in if I'm missing a detail. But there was a time when Rachel apparently was very worried about an exam. And she told her Saba that she was nervous, maybe she felt ill-prepared. Well, he shared with her a story about a similar experience he had. Maybe he hadn't studied as much as he should have for a certain test. These were in the days when grades for exams were posted in the hallway of the institution, of the building. And they didn't bother passing the grades that weren't passing grades. They had different tiers, third tier, second tier, and first tier. On the day that this exam, the grades for this exam were being posted, this exam that Corny was sure he had not done well on, he went to see the grades. And as he made his way to the wall, he first looked at the third tier. His name wasn't there. Optimistically, he looked to the second tier and his name wasn't there. Wow, maybe he was in the highest group. And he looked to the third, to the first tier and his name wasn't there. Totally deflated knowing that he had failed the exam, he walked away when somebody called him back to have him look above the first tier of names and there was his name. He had done so well that it was Corny who set the curve. Now, I don't know if this story inspired Rachel or scared the heck out of her, <laughs> but it's stories like this one that made his grandchildren certain. It made his grandchildren believe that, of course, of course that's what happened, because Saba could do anything. Now, it seems that most or all of Saba's grandkids seem to have this connection to water, frozen or otherwise. Your Saba was thrilled 
when those of you who took to water skiing did so, he was equally delighted when Andy and Rachel became water ski instructors at their summer camps. And he was also proud of Dylan and Dustin and Jason's accomplishment on the ice as elite hockey competitors. Is it Jason, did Tyler, Dustin, and Jason, and Jason with, their, with their elite hockey com competitions? And all of you have to know that you were Saba's favorite people. His 15 grandchildren gave him more joy than he could possibly imagine. I want to just share a few more things. I'm told that Montreal has its own version of the Jewish news that we have here in Cleveland. The periodical is known as the Paper Man. And I was instructed by Wendy to, is it called the Paper Man? The funeral home. Paperman's funeral home. Yes. I'm so sorry, <laughs> forgive me. Thank you. So Paperman's funeral home has their own version like the Jewish News puts out. Their website, their website and their condolences. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> and Wendy instructed me that maybe I should take a look at that site. And so I did. At 10 p.m. last night, I viewed it. There's over 50 notices, letters and notes of condolences, letters of love and appreciation addressed to all of you, to Corny's family. This is a man who moved away from Montreal sometime in the 1970s, nearly 50 years ago. I think this exemplifies the impression that Corny left on his Canadian community. And beyond that community, the impression he has left on his family, his colleagues, his dear newer friends, friends from the Strokers and his lifelong friends, the impression that he's left on his patients, all the people he helped become parents. There's a Latin phrase, carpe diem. It instructs us to seize the day. Carly, you texted me the phrase, carpe everything. I think you know, as do your siblings and everyone who knew Corny, that this really described him, not just seize the day, but seize everything, go for it. And Corny did just that. He seized everything, and he certainly left his handprint on the hearts of so many. Our tradition teaches us that words which come from the heart enter directly to the heart. And while I speak to you representing the hearts of many of his loved ones, his son David now has words in his heart that he wants to share with all of us. So I'm going to ask him to join us here at the microphone. Good morning. I'd like to say a few words before I speak. <laughs> yep. That was one of Corny's favorite lines. Corny liked to start and end speeches with jokes. Better than that, he could have entire conversations comprised of jokes and puns. I once spent an entire dinner with Corny and his dear old friend, Morty Cohn, where they finished each other's knock-knock jokes and when they ran out of those, they switched to how many blanks does it take to screw in a light bulb jokes until it was time to go. They had a blast. So did I. I did practice like 10 times at home. <laughs> I'm not even to the hard part yet, Kathy. Just give me a sec. We're all sad today. But I know Corny would have really wanted us to be happy. You would want us smiling and telling jokes and happy. I'm really going to try to channel the happiness theme to get through this. And also a quick aside, I really haven't compared notes with Kathy and the similarities between what Kathy said and what I'm going to say is kind of funny. We have some of the same things. Okay. So it's a challenge to summarize in a few minutes the life of someone like Corny. Never mind the 10,000 babies that he delivered 
Never mind the dynamic personality. It's just, it's hard to do all that in just a couple minutes. I thought about how to do this and I figured that Corny's eulogy should have three parts. First part, his pre-stroke life, full of facts and accomplishments and feel-good stories. All, you know, the, I think the posts from Montreal kind of reflect that. And as we knew him, pre-stroke, reflect that. The second phase would be his post-stroke life, which was a lot more challenging. And third, the lessons that we can learn from him. Cantor Sibo took care of the first two parts. Thank you. You did a great job, beautiful job, walking us through the facts of his life, his accomplishments, his family, and captured so much of his personality. Thank you. So the third part, breathe, breathe, breathe. <laughs> Corny's life lesson. And I think that we, had, we need a title for it. And Kathy kind of stole my title. Sorry. And I think the title is, order the entire left side of a restaurant menu to share. Corny exemplified never, short phrases, never ending optimism, hard work and continual learning. Notwithstanding all of his adversity and challenges and frustrations, he didn't complain. He worked hard. He always learned. He always thought that tomorrow would be better. Yes, he had flaws, we all do. But Corny taught us when you're faced with unimaginable challenges, put on a smile, tell a joke, work even harder. He worked really hard. Corny was the kind of doctor that if he was up all night long doing three deliveries, he'd still be there in the morning and not miss an appointment with a patient. He just worked so hard. Always help those around you. And when you aren't sure, what to order off a menu, order everything and share it. Courtney. Thanks for the life lesson. So there was recently a news story that came out. It was something that came out about something that happened towards the end of George W. Bush's presidency. The news story is he was on a secret peace mission. It was only recently made public. And on this peace mission was Nelson Mandela, George W. Bush, <laughs> the Pope, and a rabbi. It was so secret they had a single prop plane with a single pilot to a secret location. And on the way back, the pilot comes into the, cock, into the passenger area and goes, guys, I got bad news and terrible news. The bad news is we just lost our engine. The worst news is we only have four parachutes. I'm a young husband, a young father. My wife doesn't even know I took this mission. I got to go. Grabs a parachute, jumps out the plane. Nelson Mandela gets up and he says, listen, guys, I am the symbol for global worldwide anti-discrimination. And if something happens to me, the world's going to go backwards decades for race relations and anti-discrimination. I got to go. George W. Bush gets up and says, hey, if something happens to me, they're going to realize Vice President Dick Cheney is just a hologram. We're going to be in trouble. He jumps out of the plane. So the Pope looks at the rabbi and goes, what are we going to do? There's two of us and only one more parachute. And the rabbi says, don't worry, your holiness. W just took my tallest bag. <laughs> Thank you. Friends. David, thank you. Thank you, David. As we pre prepare for the rites of burial, I share with you the words of the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. I think these are appropriate for Corny on this day. Emerson writes on what it means to be a success. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden path, or a social condition redeemed. 
to know even one life has breathed easier because you lived. This is to have succeeded. As you are able now, I invite you to rise. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam dayan haemet. Praised are you, Adonai, our God, creator of the universe, the righteous judge. Adonai natan v'adonai lekach yehi shem Adonai mevarach. God has given, and now God has taken away. Still, we bless the name of God. V'yashov hafar al ha'aretz kishahaya v'haruach tashuv el ha'elohim asher natana. The dust returns to the earth as it was, but the spirit returns unto God who gave it. May the soul of Dr. Erwin Kornbluth, may the soul of Corny be bound up in the bond of life eternal. Send comfort God to those who mourn and grant strength to those whose burden is sorrow. And to this let us all say, Amen. Amen. Every funeral I say these words, today they have a different meaning. Every funeral I say, as we come into this world, there are loving hands to guide us and care for us. Who knew this better than the person who were, was the first pair of hands to guide new life? But our tradition also reminds us that when we leave this earth, it shouldn't be done in the hands of strangers. This is why we have the tradition of placing earth on the casket. And so I invite you, those of you who wish to place earth on the casket to do so at this time, uh, unless you are wearing gloves. If you're wearing gloves, you could actually put your hands on the shovel, but if you're not wearing gloves, just please pick up earth with your hands so you'll be protected given the circumstances. I'd like to ask that each of you place an additional or, um, additional piece of, of earth for the immediate members of the family who are not able to be here with us in person today. So I'll invite you to do that and then we will conclude with our two closing prayers. Susie, you want to call? Yeah. Is it okay? Mark, this one's for you. Well, I'll do one for Rachel. No, no, I got Rachel. Jason's got Rachel.
Friends, I invite you to come back uh, towards this way. Distance in a way that is comfortable and makes sense for, for your family units. We continue now with the words of the memorial prayer. El Malay Rachamin, as we ask God to accept his soul. El Malay Rachamin, Bam Romi. Am semro khana khana ta kha kam fa hashna memalot ke do shimo tarim ke zo harara ki amasiri et ni hishmat yitzhak ben avraham be khana shahalakh la hola ma began eden de hemro khato ana ba hara khamin astirai khu be sitr kana fa khalamin ve titrar ve tarara khayemet nishmato Adonai khu na khalato v'tanuach v'shalom Al mishkavo v'nomar Amen O God, exalted and full of compassion, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of Dr. Irwin Kornbluth, who has gone now to his eternal home. God of mercy, we beseech you to remember all the worthy and righteous deeds that Corny performed in the land of the living. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. God is his portion. May he rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. 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 We now continue with the words of the Kaddish. And we recite together. Yitzgadal, v'yitzgadash, shemei rabah, v'alma divra chirutei, v'amlich machutei. Bechayechon, Uviamechon, Uvachaye de Hol Beit Israel, Ba Agala Uvisman Kariv, the Amru, Ame, Yehesh Me Raba Mevarach, Leolam Olame Almaya, Yet Barach, Vishtabach, Viet Paar, Viet Roma, Viet Nase, Viet Adar, Viet Ale, Viet Alal, Shme de Kurisha, Berehu, La Ela Min Kol Virchata, Vishirata, Tushbechata v'nechamata, damiran v'yalma v'yamru, amen. Yehei shlama rabba min shamaya, v'chayim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'yamru, amen. O se shalom v'mramav, huya a se shalom, aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'yamru, amen. We pray that God who makes peace in a high place will continue to send peace to you, the mourners to Israel, and to all humankind. And to this we say, Amen. Amen. Friends, we'll be reading Corny's name beginning this Friday night for the next four Fridays when we recite the Kaddish. All of our services now can be viewed via live stream, via the temple website. We will also include his name next year when we have our Yisker service for Yom Kippur. We will include his name. As you've come here today in peace, my wish for you is that you go forward today in peace and in health. 
and on behalf of the family, for those of you who are here in person and those joining us through technology, we thank you for your love and support. This concludes our service. We ask those who wish to return to their cars. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. We're going to go out when this is all over. Hey, love you, everybody. Yeah, love you, everybody. Thank you. Love you, love you guys. Yeah, Rachel's here. Yeah, Rachel's here. Yeah, everyone heard okay. Love you guys. Yeah, there's... of this as well I can send to you okay I'll send everybody the link thank you love you guys just say dad's name light it and we'll burn your seven days okay thank you Harriet Harriet thank you so much for everything okay love you guys does anyone want to say anything unmute everybody Thank you, Norina. I love you. I love you all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go say goodbye to everybody here. Thank you, everybody. We love you. We'll be in touch with everybody very soon. Stay safe and healthy and happy. Carpe everything. Don't forget that. Thank you. Love you.